Hello everyone. My name is Charlie Frick. I'm a researcher at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory up in Laurel, Maryland, and I'd like to talk to you today about a recent pilot that my colleague Kim Watson and I worked on to automate the way that you generate, score, share, and respond to Cyber Indicators of Compromise, or IOCs. I thought I'd take a moment just to let you know a little bit about myself. I'm a researcher in our cyber operations mission area, and I've got about 18 years at the lab, and have done a lot of work with an initiative you may be familiar with called Integrated Adaptive Cyber Defense. Both Kim and I serve as technical directors for that program, and we often like to take a lot of the concepts that we've been developing through our experiments and our research to apply them in pilot efforts. And this talk today will focus on one of those that we completed last year. So with that said, I'd like to dive right into the talk. So at the kind of top level of what we did in this study, or pilot I should say, the laboratory, we conducted a pilot under a CISA cooperative agreement, basically a grant, that was focused on how to automate the generation and response to cyber indicators of compromise focused for state local, tribal, and territorial organizations, or SLTT. Our pilot achieved some pretty significant impacts. The overall, we're, and I'll go into a lot more detail on those in a few minutes, but we saw basically the timeline from the first moment an IOC is observed in the wild to when it's responded to and blocked. We brought that down from roughly three days on average to as little as three minutes on average for some of our partners. And this allowed us to really transform how that data was usable towards network defense. And I'll provide some more detail on that in a few slides. The key element that we used here, though, was the application of security orchestration automation and response, or SOAR, technologies, and our, what we call a low regret methodology for scoring the indicators. And once again, I'll go into a lot more detail on that in just a few moments. So the first thing, before we get deep in the details of what we achieved in the pilot, is I'd like to talk to you for a few moments about the low regret concept. Uh, this is a way to focus on how can we take action on information faster and consistently so that it can be more actionable for network defense. And at, just to get it out there, the key point there is looking for when you can take action faster and not disrupt your organization's operations. Now, due to the time limitations, I can't go into all the full details on the methodology, but we do offer a pretty decent write-up on the methodology as well as some sample workflows on the laboratory's GitHub page. So I included a link on this slide um, that you can go access up on GitHub where you can download a paper on the methodology as well as take a look at some of the sample workflows. These are based on what we've done in the pilot but we have modified them so that they're not tied to any one specific technology. We thought it'd be better to have a vendor agnostic set of workflows and they're available graphically as well as in an XML format known as BPMN, Business Process and Modeling Notation. Um, so if you do like what you see here and you want to learn a lot more about this low regret methodology, I highly recommend you take a few moments and visit that website and take a look at some of those materials. So the key behind low regret is that it is tailored to support the network defender first and foremost. So there is value in getting strategic insights from threat intelligence, but we like to look at it in the vein of defending our network. How do I get the network defenders information about oncoming attacks that they can block before they have to be reactionary to them? We think, you know, being able to be preventative and the, utilizing the power of a sharing community such as an ISAC is a key way to help transform our network defenses to address the speed and scale of the current cyber threat. So, what we're looking here is focusing on the likelihood of operational impact to an organization if they block an IOC rather than waiting until you've completely determined that this is definitely something bad. 
because often the time it takes to make that decision is longer than the timeline that the IOC has tactical relevance. Basically, attackers migrate very frequently from IP addresses and command and control domains, and by the time we've decided that it's definitely a bad thing, the attacker very well may have stopped using that. So while it's not a bad idea to block it once you know it's bad, it's also not helping you as much if the bad guys are no longer using that resource. So this process is looked at identifying indicators that are engaging in suspicious activity, but do not have the characteristics associated with good or necessary capabilities that your organization uses, and look like they very well may be bad. So with that, I'll talk a little bit more on that. The overall design here, you can see in this little chart, uh, is we'll take our IOC source, see if it is exhibiting some suspicious behavior. Often, and when I talk about the IOCs, I'm th talking about things like IP addresses, URLs, domains, MD5 file hashes, things that you may have extracted from various sources, sensors, etc. And what we'll do is first use a set of signature checks. Now, we worked with MSISAC in our pilot to look at certain signatures from intrusion detection systems and file detonations that they normally would use to decide to start off a manual review of a case. And so that way, if you do get an indicator inside an alert, but it's not tied to any malicious signature or suspicious signature, you can stop and say, that's probably not the best piece of data to put into an automated feed. We want to filter out things that we also know definitely aren't malicious. And that's the real power of an ISAC, because your community has certain things that you're going to want to put on allow lists that global threat intelligence vendors may not know belong on an allow list for, say, the health community. So you can allow those type of, make those type of allow lists at the ISAC to once again make sure that you're not inadvertently sending any data that's going to disrupt operations amongst your community. Then we will go through a few checks, I'll talk about some of them today that we used, to assess whether or not blocking that IOC is likely to disrupt operations. So the idea here is we can use automation to score that IOC and then if an analyst does vet it as definitely malicious later, you can always update it. But this is a way to get a faster stream of actionable intelligence throughout your whole community. And what we've used is automation, making that IOC available as a sticks object and sharing it through a taxi server. For those that are very interested in this topic, we utilize sticks 2.1. Um, but we use that because that way you don't have to have a human interacting with this intelligence before it's shared. But once again, if they do look at it later, they can send an update. And we had some good success with this in our pilot with the MS ISAC, and I'll share those details again in just a couple slides. But I want to stress that this showed pretty great value, and so much so that the MS ISAC actually transitioned this pilot feed into a full production offering before we even completed the pilot. And now they have many more members subscribing to it and utilizing that threat intelligence. So what are the type of things I'm saying for these checks? Basically, they're not super complicated. We've basically used a, you know, a zero to four scoring scale. First one is if something's on an allow list or a whitelist, don't share it. So score of zero means we have a list of domains and IP addresses that we know our community is using for their operations. Don't share that if it comes off, if that shows up on an alert, at least not in an automated feed. If a manual review finds that something critical is in fact doing something bad, of course that data will get shared downstream. But that would be something that would not just be processed by automation and thrown out without a human involved. Additionally, if we can't determine the uh, the score for the indicator, if it doesn't have a signature that matches, then that's going to get a score of one. And again, that is not shared. 
we find that a lot of these feeds often flood our network defenders with too many pieces of data that they have to manually decide whether or not to block, and we want to avoid that. Now we get into the things that we do share. A two is what we would normally call low regret. So those indicators are demonstrating characteristics that are common to malicious activity. They've not been vetted by a human yet, but we believe that taking action on them should not significantly impact your organization. So give you ideas for that. If a domain IOC is setting off an IDS alert and that domain is say under 30 days old, then it's not very likely to be a well-established service and tool that your community is dependent upon for their operations. And then additionally, you can look at things like how many IP addresses you know, or look at IP address, do a reverse lookup. So this is stuff you can get from basic who is type searches. If I have an IP address fire off on an IDS and it shows me that it's mapped to, it's resolved to 20 different domains, then that would fail to become low regret. And I would not share that in an automated feed. Now, as I said, we do that filtering automatically so you can rapidly get that data downstream. But if an analyst does conduct a case and see some of those same indicators, we can monitor that with automation and send an update to the indicator once it's been vetted by an analyst. And then we also have a category for validated, which come from those deeper dive forensic looks that ISACs often conduct with their Intel analysts. So things that might not have come off those other sources but have been validated as bad, we will share those out as well. So not enough time to go into all that detail, but as I go into our pilot, I'll also talk about some of the checks that you can do to follow low regret inside your organization as well. So with that said, I'd like to take the rest of my speaking time to focus more on our pilot. And once again, these are gonna be pretty high level summaries, but if you are interested in more information, uh, due to our partnership with the IACD project, we're able to host and provide a lot more detail on the pilot on the IACD website. So if you go there to iacdautomate.org slash SLTT pilot shareable workflows, you'll be able to get a lot more data than what I can cover here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So the overall view of this pilot was a partnership with the multi-state ISAC as well as the states of Arizona, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Texas, and uh, Maricopa County, Arizona. We wanted to kind of focus on at least one county as well as overall states. So we could take a look at various types of receiving organizations and see if there were any sensitivities. And we leveraged those IACD uh, concepts to help all of those partners develop SOAR workflows. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to buy SOARs for people. They had to be willing to purchase their own or at least enter some sort of proof of concept with a SOAR vendor. Uh, but we were able to use that low regret process to do the curation, scoring, and sharing of the IOCs. And then we also followed a lot of those concepts in the reference implementations that we developed with the states and the county for their response workflows as well. Now I like to stress that we did this on production networks. So you know we actually were able to collect real impact data on what happened with this feed. And what you'll see, I'm going to attempt to use my cursor a little bit to highlight. We started off looking at all the indicators from all IDS alerts that the ISAC collected. MS ISAC offers an IDS sensor to all their members for free and that's normally placed at the internet gateway for most orgs. And we were able to have automation look at every single alert from every single IDS for all the members and extract every potential indicator out of those alerts. We also were able to extract indicators from file detonation services that the ISAC provides. Once we ingested those indicators, we utilized orchestrated response to conduct that low regret scoring, and for the things that scored two or higher, package those into sticks objects and share on a taxi server. Then for each of the states and county, we were able to deploy SOAR workflows that regularly pulled that taxi server, got the new indicators, and followed 
response processes tailored to their own policy. And that's a pretty important thing here, of being able to bring your own enterprise and respond to threat intel the way that you have agreed to in accordance with your own security policy and, most importantly, your own risk posture. Because you, your organization might be able to take more drastic responses to certain things than your entire community can. And so it's important to look at that both ways. And as I said earlier, uh, this has now been made a production offering. I'd like to take a moment, though, to talk about what, that, what we actually saw happen when we employed this process. So I'm going to have a little chart here. This top line is going to be the manual process, kind of the legacy approach. And then you're going to show you two different routes for the automation. And as we get to the differences, I'll explain that. Now, one thing I have to stress is that I couldn't make this chart to scale uh, due to kind of the, the drastic differences in timing. But there's a few phases from when an IOC is first seen in the wild to when somebody has been able to block it. So let's start off with the first step of processing an indicator. That's the whole step of looking at all the alerts and finding indicators that are matching those signatures at the ISAC for things that we believe may very well be malicious. And determining that, oh, I think this is probably something bad. Now, the human analyst, they can do that. They can identify those IOCs in about 10 minutes. Uh, from our automation, it was happening about uh, 42 seconds for each indicator. Now, the big difference, though, comes in distributing that. In the manual process, there's a lot of human review, investigation, and making sure that they have determined that that indicator is definitely something bad. And at that point, they package it into a weekly broadcast of here are our most, of, you know, most offending indicators. When you send it out once a week, we did a little bit of a traffic analysis and saw that on average that led to about 2.7 days from when the indicator was first seen to when it was being available to be in a sharing platform. The difference with the low regret methodology is that roughly three days, that's down to about 30 seconds after we've processed it. So this is the point of processing it, scoring it, finding the ones that we believe are low regret and potentially bad and not harmful to operations, packaging it into a sticks object and loading it onto the taxi server. So you can see roughly right there, a close to three day process down to just about a minute. Once you go from there, you can now look at the timelines for that response on the receiver end. And so the first thing has to be to notify the operator that there's new data. Looking across our pilot partners, manually that happened about once an hour. With the automation, notification is automatic and brought to an operator's attention in about two seconds uh, on average. Then you have to investigate with your own policies. So on average, the manual process there, that's about 10 minutes when somebody gets to take a look at it. And with the automation, you can do that in about four seconds. So that's where I'm talking about maybe low regret for the receiver. So let's say you receive a domain indicator. Well you might want to do a quick history check and say, hey, first of all, am I already blocking it? If so, let's ignore, let's annotate that, log it, and never have a human look at that because I'm already blocking it. If, someone, if my ISAC has told me that this may be bad, let me look at my own history through my proxies and my firewall logs. Have I had nobody in the entire organization ever access that domain? Well, then it's probably not going to disrupt operations if I block it. So those are the type of decisions, and the automation can do that in roughly four seconds, um, as opposed to the 10 minutes. Then comes the process where you'll see a little differentiation. Some of our pilot partners allowed the automation to go in full auto mode. Others wanted to definitely have a human in the loop before any block was initiated, where they wanted somebody to sign off on it. And being a pilot on production you know, networks, it's a very understandable approach. What we saw was when you did put the human in the loop, eventually that led to a queue building up and roughly an eight hour delay before any block was taken because essentially it came down to once a shift, somebody would look at the whole batch of indicators coming in and decide that, okay, I'm going to block these. 
Once that decision is made, though, you'll see that the automation can go process those blocks roughly on average in about 92 seconds. Manually, it was about an 18 minute process. Now, when you look at that entire timeline, it's pretty dramatic, going from about 4,086 minutes to as little as three. So, now what we're able to see there, like I said, is going that whole ability to share the IOC within one minute versus 2.7 days is the main driving factor. And even the organizations that take that eight hour delay, you know, the once a shift approving of the blocks, that's still an 88% reduction in the overall timeline from when it's first seen in the wild to when someone is blocked. And that's pretty critical, which I'm going to get, get towards on the next slide. However, like I said before, if you go full auto, then you're able to get, you know, a 99.9% .9 reduction in that whole timeline. And those checks are pretty important for things like prevalence, like I said earlier, because what we saw was a good validation of the low regret philosophy. Amongst our receiving organizations, 99% of the indicators they received over the pilot had no history on their networks. Now, you'll never get that to 100% because somebody's alert generated the indicator. But what we found out of, a few, out of a few thousand IOCs that we processed, I believe there were three that ever had history. Uh, one of them was a piece of shadow IT that an organization didn't realize one of their departments had placed in the cloud. And the other two actually were a compromised system that they discovered. Now, with that type, those type of numbers, it's really highly unlikely that the automated blocking of these low regret indicators is going to disrupt your operations. And you also can design your SOAR workflows so that now instead of approving every block, you can review the blocks that have occurred during the day or during a shift and rapidly undo them by designing robust workflows that have those undo capabilities as well as monitoring your SOAR for certain you know, workflow errors and other potential issues. So. While that's a dramatic reduction in time, I'd like to get to a bigger point about what that actually means towards helping your network defense. So one of our partners in the pilot was willing to give us a little bit deeper dive into the data and how they used it. And what I like to stress here is, again, that power of community. We're able to look for indicators across all the members of the ISAC, even those that weren't part of our pilot, because we're looking at the IDS alerts, and we're not looking internal to their organization. We're looking at the things out on the internet that are causing the problem. So there's no sensitivities because there's no attribution back to any member. However, when you do that, you get a much you know, broader view, and then you can share those indicators to everyone. And for this particular partner, you know, we looked at a, you know, over a, about a week or two and looked at they had blocked 193 of the indicators that we had sent in the feed during that time window. 35 of those indicators attempted connections to their networks. And only 27 of those indicators had a malicious reputation on a service like VirusTotal. Now, regardless, we can see here that they're def we're definitely getting indicators that are trying to connect to our networks that don't have reputations yet. But I think it's actually a lot higher than just eight, because those 27 that had malicious reputations, what you often find is by the time that indicator has the reputation, the attackers moved on, and they're not still using that you know command and control server or that IP address. So we didn't weren't able to dive to that level of detail, but I think that that overlap between the green and the orange bar here is actually fairly slim. But the bigger point is from those indicators blocked, there were 487,000 attempted connections to that partner's network. And 273,000 of those attempts happened on the first day that the indicator was seen in the wild. If we were following the manual process, we would not have gotten that intelligence on that first date and would not have known to block this indicator until after those attempts were made. And so this is the real power here, that by using automation to get the value out of these indicators and send it in an actionable time frame with actionable context, 
we're able to block something on the same day it's first seen in the wild that we would not have found without the automated feed. So that was very useful for our pilot partners. And we had a few major lessons learned that I'd like to share, which is, you know, one thing, use of those taxi clients, that definitely is a challenge for some of our users. So that's one thing that we're working with the community to try to look at how we preserve the content of that uh, cyber threat intelligence while helping people use things like their tips to make it easier to access that data. And of course, getting the proper stakeholders, but a key part for any of these successful efforts was getting the vendor community to be an equal partner with you. When you reach out to them after the fact, it's a lot harder to help to fix issues, but we found most of the vendors were very willing to work with us, and that helps you get the features you want a lot faster. Um, another thing to stress is we focused a lot on helping to build these SOAR workflows because there's not a ton of programming and scripting experience in every SOC. In fact, many don't have much of that skill set at all for their operators. So building these turnkey workflows, helping to containerize some of these capabilities, making stuff that's easier for people to deploy is key. And another one I like to stress is that as you automate these, the use of the API is pretty critical. And one thing we've noticed is certain tools, while you might have a very robust API on-prem, when that migrates to the cloud, you need to reconduct an inspect inspection of that API because often APIs are deprecated once a security tool is migrated to the cloud. And they do that as a security stance, but we're really looking into a lot of our own research on how you could deploy API gateways, not just for scalability, but to also add a layer of security so that you could still have those robust API offerings and not have to deprecate them when they're exposed on a public cloud. Now, I don't have enough time to go into all the details, but we do have a lot more available to you if you'd like to learn more. So I mentioned that website at the, at the beginning of this section. Uh, you can go there and download a fact sheet on the pilot, but also we took the SOAR workflows that we developed for all of our partners and translated those into vendor agnostic versions with that BPMN format that I mentioned earlier. So you can download a set of, all, I believe, about 35 or so workflows that we utilized in this pilot. They are vendor agnostic because everyone has a different set of technologies in their own security stacks. But if you're looking for some process and guides on how to start, that's a place that we can begin, begin for you. And so I encourage you to go take a look there. And also wanted to let you know that we are looking to offer more of those soon through our partnership with CISA. And there'll be some more data like that available to you in the near future, as well as a uh, white paper series that we're working on for helping to share some of the best practices for security automation, as well as threat intelligence sharing. That's been inspired by the lessons we've learned on this pilot effort, as well as previous ones that we've done at the laboratory.